welcome, fans of Santa Fe Opera. Um, here is another in our series of conversations in quarantine. Uh, I'm Corey Ellison, dramaturg, and our guest today is David Henry Huang, who is, a, the, of course, a distinguished American playwright and the author of the libretto for M. Butterfly, the opera that is uh, premiering in the 2020 Santa Fe Opera season, having its world premiere. And of course, he's also the author of the very uh, distinguished and famous play on which it's based, M. Butterfly. So welcome, David. Great. Nice to meet you from quarantine. Or not meet you, but talk yes. to you. Talk to you. Yes. Um, and where is does quarantine find you? Where are you located right now at home? Yeah, so I'm at home um, in Brooklyn uh, in a district called Fort Greene. Um, if any of your viewers have ever been to BAM, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, I'm about four blocks from there. Wow, that's a, a great neighborhood to be in, but I bet it's not like the way it normally is, just like uh, the Upper West Side where I am is not the way it normally is. Um, well, yeah, we're about two blocks from Brooklyn Hospital, which uh, uh -huh. particularly when, um, you know, we're, we seem to be bending the curve, not just flattening, but bending the curve in New York, which is great. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the healthcare workers uh, park on our block. And when we all come out on our stoops, uh, it's Brooklyn, so we have stoops uh, yeah. at 7 p.m. And clap, it's a very, uh, I think, moving experience because we're not that far from the hospital. Yeah, that's something that I, I wonder if um, all of our viewers are familiar with the fact that it's become now a New York tradition uh, everywhere in the city at 7 p.m. Everyone sticks their head out the window or uh, walks outside uh, their building and makes a big ruckus uh, on behalf of the people who are uh, continuing to work on our behalf, the medical professionals, and I like to think also the food service workers and delivery people and, and uh, transportation workers who are very bravely carrying on while all of us are sheltering during this period. Um, yeah, it's one of the great things um, that's happening in New York right now. And, you know, people often think of New York as being, you know, sort of big and impersonal and people are rude. And that, of course, is true, too. But at a moment like this, uh, our ability to kind of come together and support those who oftentimes were considered marginalized uh, uh, and sometimes still being paid as marginalized workers, but we now realize are the people that are keeping us alive. Um, that is kind of a great um, New York show of unity. It really is. I have to say that New York does crisis well, you know. Uh I don't wish it upon us, but but we tend to do uh, quite nobly during crises. Where were you when this first hit, David? Were you in New York at home? Um, I mean, when everything shut down, um, I was in the middle of a workshop, um, a two-week workshop for um, a new production of a uh, a musical that I'd written in 2000 with Elton John and Tim Rice, which was sort of a pop Aida, uh, which, you know, your viewers, I'm sure know the original Aida. We did a, a pop Aida in 2000 that ran on Broadway for about five years, and we're doing a new version of it starting next year. So we were, and, and I've, I'm rewriting the book. Um, so we were in the middle of a workshop, and then we, uh, you know, uh, postponed the rest of the workshop until everybody can get back in a room together. Yeah, and who knows <laughs> when that's going to be. That's the thing, the open-endedness of this is one of the strangest aspects of this, yeah. this crisis. Um, so what is a day in your life like these days? Have you set a routine or do you just sort of play it as it goes? I mean, it's not that different from my regular life. Because I'm a writer, uh, I spend a lot of time in this room at this desk um, writing, which is what I still do now. And um, I get up in the morning, I write till for three or four hours, which is my what I've always done. And then uh, I have meetings in the afternoon. Uh, it's just that nowadays, 
you know, my life in the afternoon is largely on Zoom. And of course, I don't meet anyone for lunch. Um, but I find I'm just as busy, uh, but on Zoom and without commuting time. Right, right. So, well, yeah, it, it's great that creative artists can really uh, largely proceed as in a, a relatively normal way. I, I feel, I really feel for uh, our fellow artists, the performers, who are um, a lot more limited in doing the work that they normally do. Yeah, I mean, I feel incredibly privileged um, to be a writer. And of course, you know, I'm a script writer, so there is a more social aspect in productions um, getting shut down and stuff like that. But in terms of my ability to do my actual writing, um, you know, the New York Times published a, um, a chart of uh, pretty early on of, you know, professions and the degree to which they are at risk. And, you know, way in the really, um, uh, people who are very much at risk are dentists. And then in the other corner, writers fall somewhere near loggers in terms of our, <laughs> our exposure to the pandemic. But of course, I still have to go to the grocery store now and then and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, so do we all, so do we all. So um, what have you had the time to do that you normally don't? Now you say you've, you've uh, kept very busy, but a lot of people during this, this period are finding themselves engaging in activities that they, uh, they are newly discovered or things that they haven't done in a while that they're happy to get back to? Anything like that for you? Yeah, so I mean the difference, another difference in my life is I'm not out every night at the theater. Um, and there's been a chance to, I mean, I would love to cook, but I hadn't had, you know, had the opportunity in the last four or five years. I've been so busy. I really have been able to cook. Um, so I get to do that more. Um, I was, I was raised as a violinist, as a classical violinist. Um, and, you know, I was never like a great classical violinist. I, I come from a family where there are a lot of instrumentalists. My mother was a pianist, my sister's a cellist. Um, and I was just okay. And then I got to college and I started improvising and learning to play jazz violin. I was actually pretty good at that. Wow. So um, I've kind of, I've been meaning to get back to it and practice more. Um, and I've had some chance to do that recently. Oh, fabulous. That's wonderful. Well, that's, that's kind of a nice little perk. So yeah. what have you been cooking? If I may ask. Oh, so, um, you know, one of my favorite dishes to cook is um, a sort of Shanghainese dish called lion's head. And they're basically meatballs, um, but you try to make them very light. So, you know, you sort of mix in tofu and stuff like that. Uh, but since the last time I made it, I've become pescatarian. Um, uh -huh. So I've now figured out a way to make it using Beyond Meat, um, and oh. it turned out pretty well. <laughs> wow, oh, I would like that recipe because I too am pescatarian. So after this offline, I'll email okay, you and <laughs> we can trade recipes maybe. Um, wow, that, that's really a cool thing to learn about. Um, are there any, have you been uh, watching Netflix films more than usual? Uh, any books that you have been reading during this time that you found particularly inspiring or restoring? Yeah, so I've, um, I mean, it, yes, I have more time to watch TV. Um, I am, you know, which is something that's kind of important to me I, I, because yeah. I work in television and given, you know, the sort of, uh, peak TV moment that we're in, one always feels somewhat guilty, which is counterintuitive, for not watching enough television. Like, oh, there's all this, this thing I should talk. Um, so I'm currently in the middle of, uh, there's a, a Danish-Swedish series that I've been meaning to watch for a while called The Bridge. Um, there's an American remake of it, which I am not watching, but the original is, um, it's the bridge that connects Sweden and Denmark, and there's sort of a, a murder there, and it's um, it's very noir and dark. And so I've been watching that, um, and then 
excited to start season three of Killing Eve. Um, you know, the current season, season of Westworld, I think it's really interesting. Um, so yeah, and then, yeah, I watched Tiger King. <laughs> So it's a good time for all of that to catch up on yeah. the TV watching, which for you is um, an obligation. Um, and for most it's of us, it's a, it's a guilty pleasure for the rest of us. So um, what have you found to be the most challenging about this time? I mean, I, I think the most challenging thing is, is the uncertainty, um, and particularly for theater. I mean, I think it's, likely that theater is going to be one of the last things that comes back um, as social distancing gets eased um, because you know there's this question like when are our audiences going to feel comfortable sitting sitting in a theater um, and, and who's going to be allowed to <laughs> yeah um, and I'm in my last few months of a four-year term as chair of the American Theater Wing which um, Present, uh, founded the Tony Awards, and uh, we also present the Obie Awards. We have a bunch of educational programs. And so um, trying to come up with programs to help the field uh, is something that has been very challenging um, and also gratifying. I mean, you know, when we come up with things that, uh, that are able to get money into artists' pockets, um, that is, uh, you know, you feel like you're kind of doing your part in uh, this moment when we all need to step up. Yeah, really, really. So what do you see uh, as the role of the artist in all of this? I mean, our, our role is not as clear cut as the medical professionals or, or food service people. What, what do you think um, is, is the role of artists in this crisis? Um, I think that, you know, this, this sort of feeling that we get this feeling of unity that, you know, this sort of New York in a crisis, this understanding of who's important in our society um, and how uh, that, that we seem to be feeling now. Um, so I, it's the job of artists and particularly, I guess, writers in this respect to kind of create the narrative um, that a society uh, organizes around. And I think right now um, we are absorbing all this and we're going to uh, hopefully create work that enable this, this insight that we've gotten and this empathy that we've gotten to continue. And in the short term, um, all we can do is th the small things that other people can do to try to support um, our communities and our cities and our fellow artists. And so trying to do a little of both. Yeah, amen, you said it, absolutely. So what are you most looking forward to getting back to once all of this passes? I, I mean, you know, I'm a theater artist, so I, I, I want to go back to a theater and I want to be able to have a communal experience with live people uh, relating to live performers on stage. Um, and that will also mean that a lot of my friends who are not working and not as fortunate as I am, and a lot of uh, people who run artistic institutions or who staff it that are starting to be furloughed, that those people are going to go back to work. Amen again. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been great to talk with you, David, and I hope we get to see each other live and in person again before too long. And yeah. uh, thanks for letting us into your home and your life for a little bit. Um, thanks My so pleasure. much. <laughs> All right. Bye, bye. Bye. bye now.